Now we are recording. So I will just go over the basic logistics. Um, please make sure your audio is muted. I think you're all good on that front. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. I will be monitoring the chat while Amy is presenting. And I will also uh, be there in case you have tech issues that you want to send in the chat. Um, so if you have anything you want to ask, whether it's tech related or content related, please throw that in the chat and I will make sure that Amy is able to get that question whenever we have some Q&A time. So uh, worst case scenario, if you have any major uh, tech issues, which hopefully won't happen, um, this is being recorded and it will be on our uh, ULVLC guide, which I will put in the chat right now. Um, I don't understand what's happening with links, but when I put links in um, on Zoom, it does not look like they work. So you can always copy and paste that link. Um, but that's where the uh, upcoming sessions are listed on our calendar. And that's also where you'll be able to see our archived sessions. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce Amy Harris Hauk, Department Head for Research, Outreach and Instruction. and uh, very, very heavily involved in our general education revision. So Amy, take it away. Thank you, Jenny. I really appreciate that wonderful introduction. And I would just like to take slight exception to something that Jenny said. She actually got involved in the gen ed revision process before I did um, and has been and was involved for a very long time. So she, I don't want her to minimize her role in this very lengthy process. Um, so I have some stuff, but I also want to make sure that I'm answering questions that you all have. So I'm going to talk, but then I really want you to ask any questions that you have. Um, I may not have answers for all of them, but I will do my best. Um, okay, so this presentation is called GEC Today, Mac Tomorrow. <laughs> I was really excited about that title. Um, so just some of this is probably review for many of you, but I wanted to start with what is general education? And sorry about this. I always I hate when people say like, whoop, nope, let me go back. Sorry about this slide, but it has a lot of words on it. This is the official definition from our accrediting body. Um, the SACS, COC is what it's called. Southern Association of College, Colleges and Schools Commission on Colleges, I think is what it's called. Anyway. Okay, so basically a general education program is something that every student at an institution has to complete. Um, every school in SAC's accrediting region has to have a general education program. But beyond that, it's not too prescriptive, prescriptive what we have to have. So we basically have to have three things. It has to be based on a coherent rationale, which just means that it can't be a collection of random classes that don't make any sense. Um, it does have to be at least 30 semester hours. We are a baccalaureate program, a four-year school. Um, so our program has to be at least 30 credit hours long, 30 semester hours, they say, or equivalent because some schools are on different calendars. Um, and it has to ensure breadth of knowledge, so general education. This is supposed to be um, a way for students to get a wide variety of classes and knowledge and learning before they move on into their major programs. Um, so that, you know, the breadth thing is something, they, but they don't give you a ton of guidance on exactly what that should be. So it says we have to have at least one course from the humanities slash fine arts, one from social slash behavioral sciences, and one from natural science slash mathematics. Okay, so basically they're only saying there's these three types of classes that are required to be part of your gen ed program. And this part is really important. I think, um, as Jenny said, I'm still involved in this implementation process and this is something that we're struggling with right now. So I think it's just important to note that the courses do not narrowly focus on skills, techniques, and procedures specific to a specific occupation or profession. So if you are going to take accounting for math majors, no wait, math for accounting majors, there we go, or um, science for biology majors, or 
English for philosophy majors, those don't count as general education classes because they are tied to a particular occupation or profession, maybe not the philosophy one, but, um, you know, math for teachers or anything like that. So you can take those classes. They just can't be part of the general education program. They have to be accessible to everyone, not just people who want to go into a particular occupation or profession. But from Sachs, those are really the only rules, those three rules. And if you ever want to read the, um, what are they called? The something of accreditation, the manual for accreditation, the link is down there at the bottom. It's, if you have trouble sleeping these days, I recommend trying to read the standards for accreditation. It's very boring. Okay, let's take a quiz. How many credit hours is our current general education program? So just pop a number in the chat. Okay, we got some numbers. 30, 36, 32, 36, 33. Got the ringer. The ringer just weighed in. Anybody else got a guess? So the correct on paper answer is goes to Ms. Carolyn Schenkel. 33 hours is how many credits on paper our program is, but in actuality, it takes somewhere between 33 and 56 hours to actually complete the program. And when we started this whole revision process, that was kind of one of our founding principles is that you can't say for sure how many hours our general education program is. Um, Oh, it skipped my slide. I put in a really cute gift slide. Oh, well, I'll have to see you later. So this, just so you can see, is what our, this is called degree works. This is how students use, um, you know, when they are work, meeting with their advisors, um, this is how they can sort of check their path to graduation, okay? So, um, up here at the top, this is, sorry, I try to make this as big as I could without making it um, hard to read. So if you look up at the top where it says general education core, it says still needed, you currently have nine, you still need a minimum of 24 more semester hours. So that, if you're good at math, would indicate, hey, that program's 33 hours. If you look in the top right, it says semester hours required, 33. So you're probably thinking, Amy, you said that it's not that easy. Well, it's not. And the reason that it's not is because the 33 hours is for everything from that general education core bar down to the general education WI and SI markers. So those are part of the gen ed program, but they don't count in the semester hours. So this is where you might hear students talk about double dipping. Um, so what they can do is they can take a historical perspectives class that is also writing intensive or um, a literature class that's also speaking intensive. I don't know, I'm just making things up. So these courses, the WISI markers and also the general education global markers are requirements that students have to complete but they don't count in that semester hours required. So if a student is really good and knows how to work the system, they can double dip enough to actually take these classes in 33, 34, 36 hours. But if they're not, they can take as many as 54 hours to complete this program. So it really was sort of, well, no, it was unfair that um, it gave students who kind of understood how to game the system an advantage and gave them fewer credits to graduation. So that was kind of the situation, <clears throat> the situation that we were in. Um, sometimes there's even classes that are like, there's like this triple dip class that's like a GFA and a writing intensive and a speaking intensive or, you know, 
So it's a history intensive and global non-Western. So it's really, it, it became sort of a, well, I guess that is a valuable college skill learning to game the system, but it does disadvantage students who don't know how. And the, that's not, I don't know, that's not fair. I agree, it's a valuable skill. Why don't we teach them how to do it instead of expecting that they already know? Um, it should be, maybe we should add that. So, so that's what the degree work system looked like before. And of course, this isn't implemented yet, but I just wanted to kind of give you an idea. And I'll tell you this, I did a presentation kind of similar to this for um, the Student Government Association. And when I showed them this next slide, they all were just like, they're, all their mouths just collectively dropped because I went from this thing to this. It's a list. There's 11 classes, you need 33 hours, end of story. Now, one thing that I'll point out about this and also the way before, or the way it was before, is that it's a 33 or 34 credit hour program because of the science. So um, the sciences, one of them is supposed to be a lab. Um, which in some classes adds a fourth credit, you know, you do like a lecture and then you do a one hour lab, but some of the sciences have the labs built into the three credits. So right now, the, the new program is a 33 to 34 credit completion. So just again, to go back, so this is what it looked like before, all these requirements. Now it's a much simpler and more streamlined program. So now I'm going to take it in a little more detail. I just wanted to show you that first. All right. So as Jenny said, this has been a, well, she, it's been a long process. Um, back in the spring of 2017, um, the provost asked us to, or called for a self-study task force. So a self-study is just kind of a, a first step in thinking about revising our general education program. It hadn't been revised in like 12 years, so it was time. You know, things have changed. We wanted to kind of just step back, look at things, see what we needed to do. So, and Jenny was on that task force. She did an amazing job. Um, they worked on it for a year. They did a fantastic job. And then in the spring of 2018, they delivered a report to Faculty Senate, the General Education Council, and the Provost. And I was on the General Education Council at that point. So then in May of 2018, the revision task force was convened. So that just means that, okay, we did the self-study. We kind of have the lay of the land. We know what we have. Yes, Jenny worked really hard on the citations in that report. So you know that she's a citation librarian. And so she did an amazing job. Um, so the this revision task force was the next step. So both Jenny and I were on that first general education revision task force. We worked really hard for a whole year, tons of um, open forums. We came up with four potential plans for people to react to. Um, we had votes, we had online forms, we had also, I mean, just so many opportunities. We met with departments, um, we came to the library and met with some folks. So we went all over campus to try to get as much feedback as humanly possible on this program. In May of 2019, we took it to Faculty Senate. There were things about it that they really liked, and there were things about it that they thought we needed to look at further, change, update, think more about, et cetera. So that was kind of the end of this revision task force phase one. Then phase two started. and um, that is when I got an email from Provost Dunn that said, would you like to co-chair this um, version of the General Education Revision Task Force? I said yes, as you do. And um, I co-chaired with um, Jody Petazzoni, who is our accreditation person. I don't remember her. It's a fancy title. She's a vice something, chancellor, provost. I think she's a vice provost. Anyway. Um, so she and I co-chaired this group. Some folks carried over from the first revision task force. We got some new folks. We worked all summer long um, to take all the recommendations from Faculty Senate and incorporate it into a plan. 
Um, so then in October of 2019, they voted to pass this competency-based general education plan. So starting back in January, we started the implementation process. Um, right now, the General Education Council is working. I'm on this implementation group that's working to make sure that this program is actually ready to go in the fall of 2021. So August 2021, that's when new students who come to UNCG will start this MAC program. Also, not trying to brag, but I came up with the name. Just want to say that. Okay, so it said back in this slide, I'll go back for just a second, competency-based general education plan. So what that means, um, this is a fancy definition. I'm not going to tell you what it says. I'll tell you what I think it means. Competency-based education is really focused on things that we want students to know or to be able to do. Um, our current program is very disciplinary focused. Um, this is more based on um, skills and attitudes that we want students to have, have taught in, of course, some sort of academic context. Um, this kind of takes that to the next level. I don't know if you've ever seen commercials for like Western Governors University. I think that's the online school that is like all competency based and so basically you just take a unit you do it until you master it and then you move on to the next thing so it's very like asynchronous kind of learning at your own pace situation and we're not there we're still going to have traditional semester long classes but eventually our hope is that students who have competence in one of these areas will be able to you know, prove their competence in some way and then not have to take a specific class. So this is the courses listed in the framework. Um, there's 11 competencies listed. And um, as you can see, we've got, so uh, I'll just talk through a couple of them now. Um, a foundations course, which is gonna be a combination of transition content, welcome to UNCG, here's how to do college kind of stuff, and also information literacy and research skills. We have a written communication competency, which is where students write and learn how to write. Oral communication, you kind of see where this is going. Quantitative reasoning, that's the math requirement. Please note that math is required. Um, we had heard a few times that math is not required, but it is quantitative reasoning. Um, health and wellness, and actually health and wellness um, was one of the more controversial areas of the program, but the students really wanted it. Um, almost all the schools in the UNC system have a health and wellness requirement in their general education program. We did not. Um, and that was something that the students said they really wanted. Um, so please note that health and wellness is it's not a PE requirement. It's a three credit class that is either um, relating to mental health or physical health. So, you know, it could be a nutrition class. It could be um, a psychology class that's t teaching about mental health. It can be a kinesiology class learning about how the human body works. Um, so just something related to physical health or mental wellness. Um, critical thinking and inquiry, as you can see here, I think that one thing that um, if you ever read those surveys from employers of what skills they want people to have when they graduate, they talk a lot about critical thinking. So this is going to give students the opportunity to learn critical thinking and inquiry in different disciplines. So they'll take a class in humanities and fine arts. You'll recognize these, this wording from those SACS requirements, humanities and fine arts, social and behavioral sciences, and natural sciences. So those are those three areas that SACS said that we have to include in our gen ed program. Then we have a global engagement and intercultural understanding. Um, in the old version of the program, we had these markers called GL and GN. So we had a global non-Western and um, a global competency. So we have this global engagement competency that we have an understanding diversity and equity competency, and then data analysis and interpretation. So basically students will take one course in each one of these requirements in order to finish the gen ed program. 
So just to give you one example of what this actually looks like, so each one of these competencies is going to have some learning outcomes associated with it. The written communication one has three. So analyze written text, create written text, and de demonstrate awareness of one's own writing choices, as well as how one's own writing contributes to ongoing conversations. That outcome originally had metacognition in it, but people were concerned that nobody knew what that meant, so they changed the words around. Still means the same thing. So basically, these are the things that students will have to be able to do at the end of the class in order to be competent. So these things are really seen as skills that will take them into whatever major they go into. So these are, you know, we want students to, you know, even if they're chemistry majors, we want them to take classes in history or um, philosophy or theater or whatever area, you know, so that they can get a broad college experience. Um, but we also want them to know and to have a set of foundational skills that all students who have been through this general education program have. So that's kind of the goal here, but they're learning about it through different types of courses. Okay, so before, I'm gonna pause here for a minute and see if anybody has questions so far. So now next I'm gonna talk about kind of what we're doing now and how we're implementing this and what's going on. But if you have any questions about anything I've said so far, holla in the chat. Um, so Amy, you may have seen Mark asked a question about foreign language requirement, um, and I answered it. Um, and this might be something other people are interested in. Um, foreign language has not, for many years, been part of our general education program. Some students think it is because it is part of the additional layer of requirements in the College of Arts and Sciences, which is called LEC, Liberal <laughs> Education C. Uh, uh, contract? Compact? I think it's compact. Liberal. I think, yeah, I think it's compact. Um, and that's something else that's interesting when you, when I, Amy mentioned that I was on the self-study where we really went uh, to town around campus to try to figure out uh, what people thought about the current program, what they liked about the program. Um, and it was interesting because there was a lot of confusion from students and faculty about the difference between uh, the general education program for the whole university and the specific requirements within programs um, and within schools, which most of the schools do have sort of a layer of requirements of their own. Um, so it's interesting. We really, we gotta, we gotta market this thing better, I guess. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. And actually that, um, that sort of makes me think of something that I probably should have mentioned as like a confounding factor. And I'm sure that y'all all heard about this when it happened, but a few years ago, the, um, what are they called? General Assembly, that's what they're called, required that all the UNC system schools require no more than 120 hours to graduation. And all of the programs at UNCG were a minimum of 122, um, which, for those of you non-math majors, is a difference of two hours. So instead of cutting two, two hours um, from individual degree programs, the faculty senate elected to cut three hours from the general education program. So we went from 36 hours to 33 hours. And um, I'll just say this, this is my own Bias reporting here. Um, we do have one of the um, smallest general education programs in the UNC system. Um, most schools have somewhere between 36 and 42 hours in their program. Um, so ours at 33 is pretty minimal, um, except for I think uh, A&T's is smaller, and um, I can't remember who the other one was. But anyway, so our general education program is fewer credits than most of the others in the system. So just something to know. All right, so our current status. Um, right now, this is have a lot of the work is happening in the implementation committee, which again is a group that I'm involved in. Um, it is a subcommittee of the General Education Council. It also is sort of weirdly a subcommittee of the Office of 
student, the division of student success. Um, and so one thing I guess sort of big picture to know about this whole process is that we have kind of two, we have trains running on parallel tracks. So um, in the way that our university is run, the faculty are responsible for the curriculum. So we faculty are responsible for making decisions and voting on things that impact the curriculum. Well, the Division of Student Success and the um, Dean of Undergraduate Studies are responsible for like making sure this thing actually runs. So they're in charge of like the administrative stuff and the faculty are in charge of the curriculum stuff. So this subcommittee of the General Education Council is making decisions and making recommendations to the Gen Ed Council and also making recommendations for administration to the Dean of Undergraduate Studies. So, um, like I said, the program is going to launch in the fall of 2021, but um, because of the deadlines for having to get new courses into the undergraduate bulletin and all this kind of bureaucratic stuff, um, a lot of the course design is going to have to happen this summer. Um, so there are going to be a series of course incubators over the summer. So basically opportunities for faculty to come together for a couple days, um, work on designing a course, and then there will be representatives from um, the undergraduate curriculum committee and the general education council to provide guidance and kind of do a quick um, approval of those courses because I don't want to go too far inside the numbers for y'all, but for a new class, it has to be approved by uh, usually some sort of departmental review committee, a school or college level um, curriculum committee, and then the undergraduate curriculum committee, and then the general education council if it's going to be um, a gen ed class. So those steps in the bureaucracy take some time. So um, one of the benefits of using these course incubators is that it's going to sort of pre-approve courses so that they don't have to put all the effort in and then, you know, UCC say, no, this is not a good enough class or Gen Ed to say, no, this is not a Gen ed -y enough class. So um, the course incubators are going to kind of give a one-stop shop for people who want to develop new classes to meet these um, competencies. We're also working on a cold map. We used to call it a heat map, but then we realized that we didn't really care about the hot spots. We cared about the cold spots to try to figure out what classes we would need to meet the capacity of 3,000 students coming in to take these courses all at the same time in the fall of 2021. So that's been a really interesting process. We also asked for something that we called pre-proposals where people could suggest new courses that they wanted to teach and then we would give them some money to develop those courses. Um, so we actually just met today at noon to go in and decide which ones we definitely wanted to fund. Um, so that's cool. <laughs> I'm not at liberty to say what they are, but there's some really cool stuff in there. Um, we're also working with the registrar's office to figure out deadlines and all that kind of stuff. And then we're doing something called the Get to Mac Express, which I love. Um, and that's basically a way that courses that are already in the general education program can switch over and be Mac classes. Um, we are still trying to figure out um, all the student learning outcomes. They're actually all finalized except for the critical thinking and inquiry ones. Um, and then how we're actually going to assess this, because that's part of the gen ed program as well, is making sure that students are actually learning the things that we say the students are going to learn. So what about current students? And this is a question that, that we've had a lot. Um, so one of the things that happens when you switch gen ed programs is that you have to run two programs at the same time, basically. So students who are at UNCG now, students who start in the fall, students who start next spring, spring 2021, they will all be completing the current program, okay, so the one that we have right now. So in fall 2021, we're still going to have some of those courses available, 
what will probably end up happening is that we'll figure out which of the new classes fit the old requirements. And so they can, you know, we're not going to make them take totally, you know, we're not going to have like one section of one class on a Thursday night that meets one requirement. They're going to be able to take courses for the new program to meet the requirements of the old program. And the plan is to be fairly flexible about that. Um, they can actually switch if they're like, man, I took only one class and it was a, you know, some requirement, and but it fills a requirement in the new program. I want to switch to the new program. They can totally do that. It's up to them. And there will be lots of training for advisors on how to advise students on, you know, how, which, which way that they should go. But nobody's going to have to do both programs. Like that's, no, that's not, don't worry. So just, you know, the students who are in the old program will finish that program and then they'll be done with Gen Ed. Okay, so just so you know a little bit about library stuff. Um, the current program, oh, I should say this, when they did the last transition, this is not gonna happen. They ran two programs for seven years. We're not doing that. We're gonna figure out a way to do it in four years or less. So it's great. The reason seven years is just because people would like leave without completing their degree and then they would come back, but they would still get to do the old program. Anyway, it was a mess. So we're not gonna, we're not, we're not doing that. So in our current program, there are these things called LGs. That stands for learning goals. And there's five of them. And basically it's just sort of, here's some stuff that we want people to know. Think critically, communicate effectively, and develop appropriate fundamental skills and quantitative and information literacies. So we have these learning goals, which sounds really great. Like there's information literacy right there, I see it. But they don't actually map. You can see this huge list of courses that that goes along with, but none of them are actually a home for information literacy. Actually, no, there's not a home for critical thinking either really. So I guess GRD, but so it's in that learning goal, but it doesn't actually go into any of those letters down there at the bottom. In the MAC, information literacy is explicitly mentioned in two different competencies. So in order to complete a foundations class, students are gonna be taught information literacy outcomes and ditto health and wellness. And I'm actually, I've been excited about health and wellness being part of um, having the information literacy component to it. But I have to say that now, um, especially after having Facebook, in our current status. I'm more excited than ever that students will learn information literacy skills in a health and wellness context, um, because I think that hopefully, or possibly we've all seen by now that that is incredibly valuable, valuable um, that people understand how to access um, good health information. So that's just a sidebar soapbox for me. Um, so yeah, so this, you know, this means probably, um, you know, it gives us a little bit more focus about um, courses that we're going to meet. We have heard from some of the other competencies, namely the oral communications competency, that they still want to work with us, even though we're not explicitly there. So we do see that, you know, people are still going to want their information literacy, their primary source literacy sessions, but we're also going to have this like home within these two competencies. So I think that it's really exciting and information literacy came out really well for this. Um, the other thing that's going to happen, so one thing to know about a competency-based education program is while, of course, we have these skills and you know knowledge that we want people to have when they leave the gen ed program, but the point of competency-based education is not for it to stop there. So what what we really want to see as we move forward is that students are getting all those competencies that we all decided were really important for our students in their majors as well. So in addition to students having information literacy skills and foundations and in the health and wellness class, they're also going to have it in all of their majors. So they'll have, you know, what does information literacy look like in history or in you know philosophy or chemistry or 
you know, marketing or whatever. So, um, so these competencies will carry through to the students majors as well. So they'll get reinforced throughout the four years. Okay, man, I've talked a lot and I wanted to answer some questions if anybody has them or attempt to answer questions if anybody has them. Um, yeah, Leah, that's an interesting one, actually. Um, Ken 220 is a big class that is that has a lot of seats that's health and wellness focused or health focused. Um, again, I'm not at liberty to discuss specifics, but we did see a couple of the pre-proposals were about health and wellness. Um, so yeah, we're we're working. the The cold map should be out pretty soon, and um, I'm hoping that we can can get that out so that people can kind of see where the gaps are. But there is some really cool stuff, and I think the thing that's really interesting about this um, is that it gives it gives a lot of people an opportunity to provide general education classes, and I think you know, when you think about gen ed, you think about like, yeah, I have to take a history class or I have to take a English class or whatever. But, you know, now you get the opportunity to, yeah, take a health and wellness class or you can, um, you know, you can take it in, in different ways and from different departments who maybe don't consider themselves part of the general education program. Um, so, Sean, that's a really good question. We actually haven't talked much about offering these classes. I mean, I, I think that, of course, we are cognizant that there are students who are 100% online. Um, and so, you know, we're looking and making sure that we're offering enough capacity for those students um, in, you know, the Bachelors of Liberal Studies program and the BIPS, Bachelors of Integrated Professional Studies, which are both fully online programs. Um, but I think a lot of the proposals that I've seen at least are still for face-to-face -face classes. And I think that um, that people, you know, see the value in having both, but also having some sort of face-to-face -face experience um, for students in gen ed. So I hope that there's a mix of both because I see value in both of them. But no, we haven't had a lot of discussions about those to give you the short answer. What other questions? Do y'all want to like, you can turn on your mics if you want to ask questions out loud or um, Can I ask a question, Amy? Ooh, I don't know. I yeah, guess. I yeah, okay. okay. <clears throat> you may be going into this, but I'm wondering, um, I have my I have my thoughts on how I would answer this question, but I'm wondering what you think some of the biggest challenges were as part of this process. Wow, um, the biggest challenge um, was buy-in and um, getting people's buy-in on what a general education program should be. Um, and that I think was a large, a big challenge for us um, because, and I'm not, you know, I don't know what this is like at other institutions. I'm going to say a number that seems right to me, but maybe it's not. Something like in the 70s percent of our current general education classes are taught by graduate students and contingent faculty. So the way that it has been at UNCG is that trying to think of a nice way to say this, that a lot of faculty maybe weren't really invested. Maybe it was, I was thinking 76%, but I decided to, to, to blur that a little bit because I wasn't sure. Um, I think they aren't, they weren't very aware. Yes, yes. I mean, I think they knew that students take gen ed classes, but I don't think that they would necessarily know what is involved in the gen ed program, what the requirements were. Um, so it, it's interesting because of course, you know, a, I don't wanna, a lot of disciplinary faculty who mostly teach like upper level undergrads and graduate students are very focused on 
their majors and what their majors need to know um, and what skills they need to have to get a major in their department or school or whatever, but they weren't so much focused on the general education part of that. Um, so that was an interesting challenge. Um, you know, there were people who said that they didn't think there should be a general education program at all. And um, that would only work until Sachs found out and then we would be closed. So that is not a viable option, nor should it be, in my opinion. But um, there was a real, a real lack of knowledge about what the program was and what it should be. So if, you know, so there were a lot of spirited and lively discussions about Gen Ed. Um, and again, a lot of varying opinions on its importance and what it should be. But I'm hoping that for now, in this moment, since we've been through all this over the last three years, that people know <laughs> what Gen Ed is and why it's important. And hopefully, they're interested in it, they're excited about it, they see the value. Again, this is probably just me being idealistic, but um, I, I just, I think that general education is so important to produce people who are well-rounded college graduates. And um, I really hope that there are more faculty on campus who see that now. And I will say, again, having looked at these pre-proposals, there are a good number of them from tenured faculty members and hopefully i'm hoping that means that more full-time faculty are going to be willing to teach these courses um, because i think i mean I, I think the good thing about the courses being taught by especially contingent faculty is that they are really good teachers typically because that's what they're hired to do. Um, but I really think that in order for the program to be successful, it needs to have a good combination of um, graduate students, you know, part-time contingent faculty and also tenured and tenure track faculty because the tenured and tenure track faculty are the ones who get to make the decisions fair or not. And so they need to be involved and invested in the program so that they can do um, what's right, what's best for the program, in my opinion. Is that an okay answer? I wandered a bit. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, I, I know um, from the self-study uh, element of it that first year, I was surprised, like you said, at all of the sort of different opinions or different understandings. I remember that we did a survey of students um, and a bunch of them said that they thought that the gen ed program was just like a way the university made money off of them. <laughs> and, I, and we were all like, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, so no, it's just, like, I think it'll be important for us knowing some of these things at the very beginning um, will be like a bit better messaging about gen ed, better understanding campus wide so that we can all be kind of on the same page about what gen ed is and what it means, but that's going to be hard still, I think. I, I think so too. And I think, you know, that one benefit to this whole implementation thing is that it gives us a lot of, I mean, I guess excuses is the best word, excuses to talk about this a lot. Um, because, yeah, we had the previous program for 12 years so far. So, you know, it just kind of became like, oh, it's a thing that you do because reasons, you know, and now it's kind of like, cool, we just, I mean, and, and I know that when they implemented it, they were like, this thing is amazing. This is what we need, you know, like they were how, how we are now, you know, the wisdom of, or the, the zeal of the recently converted or whatever. But I think that it gives us an opportunity to start over and to really talk to people about gen ed because it gives us an excuse to talk to people. Um, and, but like Jenny said, yeah, this is where they learn how to do research and learn to write and speak, right? Well, that again, 33 hours, it's not enough to learn all of those things, <laughs> but the point of this program, and I think one thing that we've done pretty explicitly is to say that this is a foundational program. This is gonna give people the skills to get started so that they can go into their majors and build upon those skills 
into you know the areas that are required for their major or that are most important for their major. Um, and it's really important that students you know, have this general experience because some of them, and again, I forgot the number, I'm gonna say it's in the 80-ish percent, 80 -ish percent also of students who change their majors. And I changed my major probably like seven times when I was in college. So, um, you know, you need this sort of broad general experience so that students have time to explore and they have time to learn about what they're interested in. And, you know, like Jenny said, Students, a lot of them see Gen Ed as a series of boxes that you have to check, which it is, and it has to be, and it's never going to not be that. But what we want is that students see it as a valuable experience and not just something that they have to finish in order to get to their majors. Like some of my favorite classes that I took in college were my Gen Ed classes. Um, so, you know, it gives them an opportunity to take a some sort of cool class. And um, I think this new program, especially the foundations part, um, is gonna be, there's gonna be some cool like topics that people can take and, and learn about something that's not maybe in their area of expertise. Um, so, and Lois's comment about, was that School of the Arts? Because their gen ed program is really small too. Um, yeah, right, and do public speaking. And I mean, I think it's interesting because you know, we have this oral communications competency, but it's fairly similar to CST 105, which is a course that most students take, but not everybody is required to take it. So now they'll be required to take a course like that. But, you know, now we can say that maybe the students will come out of, out of this oral communications competency where they can all do public speaking. Wouldn't that be amazing? But it's public speaking and other types of speaking as well. But, um, you know, they're, the English 101 class is not a learning how to write class. And one, I mean, it's learning about writing, but um, the new program is going to have explicit writing instruction in it. Um, and that's one of those things that I've heard professors say is like, why don't they know how to write when they come to me? And so hopefully this will help with that. I still don't believe that you can learn how to write in one class. Um, yeah, exactly. Yes, they should already know how to write. It is a process, but if they can all take a course with, you know, the same learning outcomes and we can say, okay, if they've been in this class, they at least have some foundational writing skills and then they can get to the nursing school or the business school and then they can learn how to write for nursing or write for business, but hopefully they'll all have these foundational skills to draw on. I just, I picked nursing because, not because I think they're bad at writing, but because you're the nursing librarian. Um, so, yeah, but I, I've heard that from all over campus. Yeah, they took English 101. They should know how to write, and that's not, yeah, that's not how it works. All right, other questions? Actually, this slide is misleading because I don't have any more content because I wanted to make sure that everybody got their questions answered. Sorry, <laughs> I thought about changing it and I was like, but it's cute and I don't want to change it. Um, I have another question, Amy, sorry. Um, my question is if there was one thing that you wanted all of us to know about this new MAC program, what would it be? I mean, I think, Oh, that's a, gosh, that's a good question. Wow. I think that the one thing isn't even really about the program itself, but just to know that the program that we ended up with came out of thousands and thousands of hours of work and feedback and talking to people and all that sort of thing and working within a lot of constraints and um, it's not perfect and yes oh yeah, dang it Sean you're right people should always know that I created the acronym but um, but that it's not perfect and it will never be perfect but that the things that have been done were done with great thoughtfulness and care and that this is really a program created by a bunch of people who care deeply about general education and making sure that 
students have what they need to both, you know, be successful in their majors, but also in the world. So that's, that's the big picture thing. Also, information literacy is all over that program. And that's pretty exciting too. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Amy? I'm not seeing any questions, so I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. All right. Oh, I need to do my thank you to Star Carnival. Go. It's a very, very nice slideshow. Very nice. Very good job. I chose it because of the colors, as you might have guessed.